Welcome to our first ever episode of Two Voices, One Goal. This is our series where we bring voices from across the construction industry who share our goal of improving education, compliance and safe practices. You can expect to learn things about new regulation and guidance and hear opinions from across the industry. I hope you find it as interesting as we have. Let's introduce our first ever guest, a YouTuber, electrician, fire safety expert, business consultant. It's Dan Jackson, aka Dan's the Engineer. Let's call him now. Dan, great to have you on board. Thank you for having me. So, you've broken some big news lately. You're coming back into the industry. Yeah, I have indeed. And, um, uh, I mean, we're in the middle of coronavirus, um, you know, pandemic or whatever you want to call it. So, it's, a, it's an interesting time to come back, but here I am. And what persuaded you? What persuaded you to make the change and come back? It's not. It kind of just fell into place, really. So, obviously, I, I kind of had a, a career break from the industry, which was um, much, much needed, I must yeah. say. Um, come back to the UK, and I was, I was doing stuff within the industry when I come back, so I was consulting, but mainly I was helping um, companies in terms of management mm. and business growth, but also uh, technical consulting as well. So... I was dabbling in, but not really, nothing was set in stone. It was freelancing, kind of doing bits here and there. And that, now, what kind of uh, brought me back into setting up again is kind of just circumstance. Like um, I was working for a lot of clients, so, you know, building owners who I would help them sort of manage their contractors and, and contract works, firearm works, electrical safety, that kind of thing. And a lot of them kept saying to me, why aren't you setting up a contracting company? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I kind of ignored it for a bit. Um, and then some opportunities came along and I thought, do you know what, the calling just seems right. I, had, I actually had a, a big project I was working on consulting and it kind of come to a natural end anyway before coronavirus, but straight away it, it kind of like stopped it full stop. Yeah. Um, and also, a lot of my smaller clients that I was helping out with, sort of business consultancy, they have no money. No. Nope. Even though I was contracted, and in theory, they would still owe me money, I just kind of said, look, I, the purpose is me to help your business, not burden it. So if it means that we've got to stop now and maybe cut ties, or if you want to continue in the future, so be it. But I don't, just because we've got this written contract, I'm not a greedy person. Yeah, let's, yeah. Just, let's just call it a day. Um, and a lot of them really did appreciate that because obviously it was a bit like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. We're stuck in our homes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's kind of like how it happened, really. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's a massive change in circumstance, and it's, I mean, it's led to quite a lot of people trying new things. And if it's you coming back into the industry, well, I'd say that's a good thing for the industry. So, for people who haven't been following your channel, um, give us a bit of a rundown on new Terra compliance and what you do. Yeah, so my new company is called New Terra Compliance. Now, we we look after fire safety and electrical safety. So we work for building owners or property managers or clients who have to manage fire safety and electrical safety, and we hold their hand. So we kind of do some consulting, but also I run a team who install fire alarm systems and carry out electrical yeah. work. So it could be electrical testing. We... Don't get me wrong, we would take on electrical projects, but it's more about the maintenance, uh, the testing, meeting legislation. But it, it's, it, it's not just that, it's the advising as yeah. well and, and pointing them in the right direction. So they come to me with trust and confidence that I'm trying to help them make sure that they're, they're meeting their, you know, their legal duties, but also something that works for, for them. It has to work operationally. We, of course, we've got legislation but we've also got operational reasons. So, you know, a lot of the, the RRO, for example, is very, is directed at life safety. But a lot of my clients, it's about property protection as well. Yep. It's about protecting the assets and coming up with something a little bit sensible. And, and to, to be honest, Carlson, I work for, you know, I'll take inquiries, but really my, the people I work for value fire safety and electrical safety and what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. They're quite rare, those people. <laughs> Telling me. <laughs> but they do exist, and that's that's what I'm here for, and that's what my business is for. No, that's fantastic. And as this whole industry changes, I mean, that those kind of 
the people who do value it is only going to grow. And as we see, I mean, we've seen literally just, was it last night, another um, tower block gone up? Um, yeah. And they've just taken the cladding off that. And it's like, wow, that was in the nick of time. <laughs> you know, a, a few months earlier, and that, that would have been another Grimfell scenario. So it's, I think we're starting to see people actually, um, you know, taking it more seriously, do you reckon? Since Grenfell, definitely um, things were taken more seriously. I noticed at the time, because I had, a, for anybody who doesn't know, I had a previous company for eight years. Uh, they were primarily electrical contracting, but we, you know, we installed fire alarm systems as the main source of what we done. Um, and we noticed a massive increase in budgets being pushed forward for, you know, fire alarm systems being installed and, you know, everything else. So I think attitudes have changed, but obviously it's not a quick fix. No. It, I mean, anybody who has looked into Grenfell, it's not one thing, it's a series of issues. Yeah. Uh, and anybody who, you know, who are in, who's in this industry, we understand that we can see them, but... It's it's so difficult just to pinpoint on one li- literal thing. It's a massive shift that's going to happen. Like it has to happen. Um, well, that's so. Well, that's so interesting you say that because um, I don't know if you've seen the um, uh, Dame Judith Hackett speech at the MBS, but um, I mean it's a fantastic speech that. But she goes over. She's she's just saying. You know, on the night of Grenfell, after Grenfell, when the inquiry was launched, all of you wanted me to say it was a cladding. And she said, it's, the cladding is one small part of a massive syst- like catalogue of errors and the broken, yeah. broken system, basically. So it's, it's kind of, she's got the job of fixing the system, not just the, you know, the cladding. <laughs> that. And you know, I've been involved and, um, in some inspection into fires on certain aspects before, and it literally is a series of events. Something causes the fire, then it spread, catches on fire, it spreads, and then it moves from one place to another, and, it, and before you know, it's out of control. And obviously, you've got there's so many different aspects of fire safety. And, and the problem is, is that a lot of people, like fire alarm engineers, they're only educated and understanding of the fire alarm system. They don't yeah. understand fire stopping. They don't understand AOVs. They don't understand fire extinguishing unless they do that additional training. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a series of things. It's about detection. It's about uh, limiting risk. It's about um, spread of fire and how you contain that and fighting fire. It's, it's a category of different aspects to it so it's literally not one thing and it's certainly not just cladding yeah it's certainly not just cladding <laughs> so it's, it calls on basically people like us and you to actually be a bit more um you know to network wider in the industry and help train each other i guess to make sure we all understand how our different areas affect each other i suppose yeah we, we've definitely got to communicate for sure um, and that, that's the great thing about um you know, social media is well, it's also the downfall of social, you know, downfall of everything. Yeah. But um, it, it's, it's good, it's an open forum. But so discussions are good, but obviously it needs to be communicated correctly to the right people. Yeah. Um, because I mean, I see so many people spouting stuff online, and it's like, oh man, that person, he shouldn't be saying that because other people might believe what he's actually <laughs> saying. Uh, I think the other day, and it, it's hard um, because. Again, I you know I only know what I know, and yep. that, 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 that's ultimately that's competence. You know what you know, but you also know what you do. you you know you're aware of what you don't know. So you don't. Like, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on cladding because I'm not. No, absolutely. Uh, you know. No, that's really interesting. And what was it that um you know going back to the beginning? How come you got interested in fire safety? So my background is um, electrical. So I trained as an electrician. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked at his experience, but I kind of 
was forced into uh, the install side and then when I was working with the commissioning engineer um, after I installed the system he would show me how to do and to be honest he was really lazy like <laughs> seriously lazy um, so I was like oh, I've had enough of him so I used to start commissioning stuff myself yeah. and then I've done a range of things like aspirating um, systems and I've always been really interested so I you know when I do something Carlson I I you know, I put 150% into it. Yep. Um, I, I do my background research. And and then when uh, I got made redundant in 2010. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Or during the recession, um, which is a long story. I'll explain mm-hmm. that another time. But um, and it set up a new company. And I went for a maintenance contract, electrical maintenance contract with a uh, rather large uh, brewery. And... Mm-hmm. Part of it was to take on the fire, and they they required us to be both accredited. Yep. Um, Road three slash one. So I kind of got the company to that point and worked it, and and from there on, I just found it fascinating looking into fire behaviours. If you've ever been up to um, the place in the Cotswolds, I forget the name of it now, but um, I've done some training there. Interesting. And it's just it's fascinating stuff because even as a firearm engineer. A lot of the time, you're not really, unless you look into it yourself and do further training, you're not really told about fire behavior. You're just told a detector goes there or it doesn't go there. Yep. (laughs) Uh, And the electronic side of it, but really it's about fire. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. When you start to understand fire behavior a little bit more, I think it definitely helps you in your career. Yeah. Now that's interesting on how you're onto it. Um, So from like content that you're creating i'll say you come across safe some pretty horrific safety issues on a, a pretty much a weekly basis so what what is it that concerns you most when you know when you're seeing these errors is it what's, what's the what's the cause of all this i mean i think there's many causes but there's there's just there's a horrible attitude of just low standards and what is accepted it's a case of just banging in and it'll be fine and, and that definitely is cost driven by, yeah. it's cost driven by clients but also contractors who kind of uh, fall into that trap are part of the problem as well because if you're if you're turning around and say this project is 20k and then they say no 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 we've got to shave 5 grand off it and you do that you are part of that problem mm. and we definitely saw this during the last recession because you know work started becoming a little bit sparse and all of a sudden people are doing things of cost and the problem with that is that the market value goes down yep hard to get back up again absolutely <laughs> so I think it's, it's definitely an attitude of how we are trained and what is accepted so I regularly see brand new installations with things aren't installed correctly um, in fact a lot of firearm Anybody who runs cabling or pipe work are the worst offenders of breaching in fire barriers because mm. there's a massive lack of education around yep. it. Um, so you're, potentially you're, you're creating problems. You're installing a detection system, but you're creating, you know, construction problems if you like. Um, and a lot of it is the attitude, I think, Carlson. Like um, I've had so many apprentices work for me over the years, and you have to drum into people who enter the industry the the right attitude from day dot. Yep. Or high standards, this is how we do things. No, you can't just leave it like that. It has to be to this standard. I, I've been I've been so harsh on people in the past. Like I mean I'm a bit more chilled out now. But ever since having children, I kind of like chill zoned out a little bit more and chilled out. Yeah. But when I was younger I was absolutely brutal and I've had people fired, I've had people kicked off site, I've had all sorts, because if it wasn't to my standard, you're gone. And mm. that's that. And I wasn't nice about it. Nowadays, I'm a little bit more diplomatic. Yep. <laughs> uh, but again, the standard's there, otherwise you're gone. You yep. only get to work with me if you work to this particular standard, otherwise see you later. You can, you can join the rest of them. Absolutely. Um, no, it's so refreshing to see, uh, see people who do take it that seriously. <laughs> it, it, it has to. We're talking about people's lives mm. like you, as, if you're working in fire safety or even electrical safety you have to go to bed every single night knowing that everything you've done that day has has not contributed to somebody getting hurt injured 
injured, you know, or, or dying. Absolutely. And, and some of the problem is that people aren't actually aware that they're doing something wrong or incorrectly because mm. there's very little requirement for them to actually know. Yep. And that's, that's the issue. Like, I mean, I know this is off fire safety, but um, electrical safety, we've just had the, the government change some regulations for private rented sector. Um, and you know, there's, there's now a legal requirement for electrical testing on rented properties. But just because you get someone in the door who says they're doing a test, doesn't mean it's done correctly. Yep. So obviously, you look at my price, which might be 300 quid, you look at one another and it says 50, of course you're gonna go, well, I wanna spend 50 quid. Yep. So it's, it's an education. And the problem with our legislation is that I think it's a complete conflict of interest because the person who's responsible for the compliance is also responsible for the finance. Yes. Complete conflict of interest. No. So I... the person who, who goes to jail is also the person who's financing the whole thing if something goes wrong. And I understand that that person, you know, there has to be something going on there between, you know, the client as the, you know, they're accountable and also, um, you know, obviously they're paying for the thing. But there's, there's nothing in between enforcing that. Yeah. And so if you, what you find is all the people who, who stick by legislation, go by the book and everything else, um, they're the ones who actually potentially suffer because they're paying the additional costs for, you know, training, um, British standards and everything you're supposed to be doing. Um, and obviously, you know, you can get work, but it is costly to run any fire safety business, mm. any fire safety. But the, the charlatans who don't know what they're doing, they just do whatever they want. Yep. <laughs> they get away with it. The only, it only becomes a problem when there's a fire. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's like when you see people building, say, tower blocks, and they go to 17.99 metres because it gets them away from 18 metres. You know? Yeah. It's, and then, but now, I mean, attitudes are changing, hopefully, for the best, like saying that, no, you've got to be practical, and it's all about actually you've got to be seen to be doing the right thing, not just going by the book. So if you just go by the book and you don't have the right attitude, as you were saying, then you end up with these problems where you do get people building to sort of say, just below the tolerance or something. So, no, that would be an interesting change. Um, I mean, we find it fairly horrific from our standpoint when we see non-compliant smoke vents being locked into buildings and people sticking things in there saying that, calling it a smoke vent, and it doesn't even have a declaration of performance. So it doesn't even comply to any standards. And there's still banging it in there and calling it a smoke vent and so it's, it's that sort of it's about that education and making sure that as you say the person who's spending that money realizes the reason why they're paying a bit more is because they're getting not just something that's better but the only thing that's actually compliant as opposed to as opposed to just a load of crap yeah. and i think i think it's just i think it is the lack of understanding of what actually is compliant mm. um, because the, the issue there is that the the client to actually, you know, they're not going to understand unless they un- they have a knowledge on AOVs and you know smoke control. Yeah. So therefore, they rely on the person installing it. Completely rely on the person installing it. And, to to uh, be honest with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see, sm- I see, you know, people calling things smoke vents all the time, and I'm not a smoke vent, you know, engineer or anything, but um, you can tell they ain't, they ain't right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's very interesting. Um, I've got a question for you, Dan. Um, you know, with this, all these new um, results that are coming out of, um, of the Grenfell inquiry, etc. Um, Robert Jenrick, housing secretary, is putting in a huge amount of effort to try and drive this forward. Um, if you had, if you got to spend some time with him, what would you, what challenges or questions would you put to him? I would um, say to him that somebody needs to enforce fire safety. Yeah. And, and not just write down some documents and say you must and you shall um, comply to this regulation and that regulation. Actually, physically, somebody is accountable that's got nothing to do with the client, got nothing to do with the, um, uh, you know, any finance arrangements, who, you know, goes out and ensures that things are right. Now, I understand cost-wise that can't be literally every single installation. Yep. I get that, but there should be at least a sample of, you know, I call them a consultant um, who who will actually overlook it. And if something goes wrong, that person is the person who's responsible as well. Yep. So, you know, and, and obviously it's quite complex. So what I've just said is a, is a massive thing, but, you know, just throwing something out there that 
whenever I've worked on projects who had a third party consultant for the client, but was signing documentation to say they take accountability and responsibility on behalf of the client. Let me tell you now, those installs were always absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Because his job to go in and, you know, pick things to say, hang on a second, you know, cabling clips here need to be spaced correctly, blah, blah, blah. Um, this isn't quite right. This isn't to the standard. And come up with, you know, something that's sensible. However, someone's got to pay for that. We, well, we used to have a name for them, didn't we? Weren't they called the Clark of Works? Clark of Works, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm major, I think, you know, and that's something that Dame Judith Hackett's been saying as well. It's such a massive welcome to start seeing Clark of Works coming back to, back to life, back to projects. Clients starting to employ them again. Because I remember, um, you know, I'm obviously a lot younger than you are, but I've, I've had a lot of anecdotal experience from people on site saying, you know, you get the Clark of Works come around and says, no, that's a crap job. You're going to rip it up and you're going to do it again. And, and until you do it properly, the Clark of Works isn't going to let it go. Yeah. I mean, recently, uh, a friend of mine, had, again, I'm going back to electrical, but fire's no different. Um, they had an electrical company come round and apparently rewire their, their, their tenants. They, they had this company rewire their flat, and she showed me images that were just frightening of what they'd done. Really? So I contacted the, the electrical company, and I, I requested information from them about their accreditation, about their insurance, and everything else. And um, I said, you know, this is a breach of regulation, so and so, which this is a, re a breach of statutory legislation. Um, and before you know it, they've come round and they've rectified everything because I, I said, I'm going to go round and I'm going to check it. Mm. And I said, I will report you to your, um, your, your trade body. And also, I'm working on behalf of the tenants here who are at risk. There's some legislation here that, you know, legislation to go by to make any sort of prosecution and claims um, against whatever. Um, so, and of, of course, the landlord was uh, more than happy because the landlord thought that they were fine. Yeah. They thought they thought it was absolutely fine. They just put trust into his company. But So essentially, I was acting as a clerk of works, mm. um, but not in a financial capacity. I was just helping out a friend. Yeah. But as soon as somebody who says, no, you are doing things correctly, and that is that, and, and you, you do start to see that, you know, companies, if they, if they the, the problem is if, if you know you're going to get away with it, um, you're going to do it. Mm. If, if, because when you're in contracting, it is about money. Unfortunately, it is about money um, for the majority of companies and business owners. So you're going to get a conscious decision on something when something doesn't quite, quite go right. And if you're trying to get work, you know there are obviously financial implications there. Um, so if people knew that there's a chance that they're not going to get away with it, then it's less likely to happen. You Absolutely. Know, have work, what have you. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And do you, um, out of interest, do you lose jobs when, um, as a result of, do you, if, if people say, you know, um, I, I want a cheap job done, do you turn it down? Yeah. Um, I, since I've started up, I've had loads of people come to me for doing certain bits and pieces, and a lot of it I do turn down. It's not, it's not stuff I'm interested in doing. Um, the type of work I want to do is to, for it to be a, a correct job. You have to pay for that, and it's not. The thing is, it's not extravagant money. It really isn't extravagant money. Yeah. It's to me, it's really good value for money. Um, but obviously, if you're twenty percent more than somebody else, um, but some. What I, I mean, I made most of my money in contracting through sorting out other people's mess ups. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And I kind of say, and it bugs me because. Really, the client should have paid first time and had it done correctly. Not paid twice. <laughs> Not paid twice, but the, the problem is it's like, um, you know, the title of firearm engineer or an electrician is kind of, you know, what does it mean these days? It, mm. it doesn't really mean a great deal. Any Tom, Dick and Harry can just come in and do it. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. But, yeah, I, I mean, constantly, um, I, I wouldn't say losing out because I'm, I'm not losing anything. No, absolutely. No, that's really interesting. Um, and uh, that brings me on quite nicely onto a, a particular bugbear of yours. Um, with you, you mentioned a lot about cowboy contractors. Um, how, do, how do you define a cowboy contractor? Yeah, I'm quite harsh with the word, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> it, it's basically the incompetent, um, and you're either consciously incompetent or unconsciously incompetent. <laughs> so you, you get the people who are who know that they're not doing things correctly 
Yeah. But then get the ones that they don't actually have a clue that they're doing things correctly. And I'd say the uh, the latter is probably better because at least sometimes they they actually want to understand and learn. Mm. Um, but I mean, I, I just see it all the time, and it's I do feel bad sometimes because some uh, some clients get me involved in little projects where I'm overlooking somebody else's work, and, and the, you know it might be a one man band who, who's just trying to feed his family. Yeah, and he's. He's taken on a fire alarm job when he's an electrician. He's installed a load of detectors in the wrong places. He's not he's not set out things zoning correctly, uh, which is you know pretty important. And um, or installed parts of a system that I would deem that it makes it not fit for purpose. And then he's got to go back and rectify. It. And that's you know that's a day's money. And you know he should be looking at it as a lesson learned, and he should only be doing it as as he needs to. But at the same time, he's he's a guy putting food on the table when paying a mortgage. Yeah. You know, it, it is difficult. But I've, I've always, I mean, anybody who comes to me, Carlson, literally anybody who comes to me on social media or whatever, I'll always help out in how I can. So mm. I get a lot of electricians who come to me and they're like, I've listened to your podcast because I'm, you know, I'm involved in podcasts, videos, um, interview, you name it. I've done talks. Um, and they'll say, I'll listen to you. And, and you're, you're right. I should really be installing the fire alarm system. So what training can I do? I'll point them in the right direction. Or I'll sit down with them and actually go through the British standards. And yep. Um, which I want. A lot of these people don't even know. <laughs> um, and, you know, depending yeah, for the fire alarm, British standards, 583 part one and part six are actually some of the easiest to read. And, you know, there's a few little grey areas in it, but generally speaking, it's pretty black and white. Um, so I'll sit down and educate and try and help, mm. rather than just be like, you're not doing this. Cause I've got a bit of a, I've got a bit of a, um, you know, an ethos that if I if I come up with a problem, I've got to come up with a solution. Yeah, absolutely. So... No, I mean, I, I, we've found the same thing recently. We found there's, you know, people aren't under, weren't understanding for, you know, AOVs and smoke ventilation. And a lot of times going around talking to various people, in, like specifiers and procurement people and so forth, and they don't understand what they're purchasing. <laughs> and so that's why I'm, we're trying, you know, we keep a rolling education program, weekly videos and CPDs as well, um, to try and we make that they're free and widely available, pay for people's lunch to come along and just try and help people understand so that because it's not fair to say to criticize people saying you're not aware of what's going what what the standards are if you're not going to prepare to help point them in the right direction to bring them up to the scratch isn't it yeah and i also feel for me in the past and especially now it's helped me kind of gain work by not just actually doing the work but educating contractors and clients it's not uncommon for me to be in a tender medium with two other contractors where the client is asking me the technical information and how we should do things mm. for the purpose of the other contractors. Yep. It's, I've been in that situation so many times and it's so ironic because sometimes they end up getting the job. Yep. And you're like, they don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, but for me, it, it kind of helps because it helps clients see that we know as a business what we're doing and then it's a choice for them to go, yeah, we're willing to pay for that or we want to go somewhere else and, you know, whatever, it's, it's down to them. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Yeah, so Dan, uh, you support a lot of young people coming into the field and a lot of young people um, setting up new businesses and obviously there is a tendency that or people can be tempted to, if they're coming up against people who are undercutting them on price and, and therefore quality, there's a temptation for some people to fall to that level. How do you help them make sure they don't they don't do that and to maintain that professional edge? So when you go out on your own, you haven't got many people to guide you and mm. to kick your backside, whereas when you're working for someone, there's always a manager, a supervisor, a boss or whoever. Um, so it, it, people can fall into that trap of, becoming a bit lazy with stuff and especially when you start to see actually how much money you're not making mm. um, because you're not pricing correctly and you have all, all these overheads so if I directly work with people I kick them up the backside yeah. um, and push them to you know increase standards but generally speaking I just say be a professional yeah. and, and that, that's your added value to your client they are paying you for your knowledge and 
you know, there's a big difference between a, a young 21 year old who's just set out in the game, um, set up on his own, to somebody who's been doing it for 15 years and has had 15 years of different experiences, different qualifications, has seen different regulations come in. You know, there's there's a completely different, and, and it's about educating the client as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really helpful. Um, well, thanks for that, Dan. I appreciate the advice you've given people on this, um, the way you've covered off a lot of very pertinent topics, especially including Clark and Works. Um, I'm sure that you, like us, are looking forward to these new changes coming in that will help make things safer. Um, but thank you very much for joining us on the show today. And hopefully when uh, we've got a few more of these episodes under the belt, it would be awesome to have you back, see how new Terra Compliance is getting on, and see how it's growing. Thank you very much. Catch up soon. Thank you, Dan. Well, that was it, our first episode of Two Voices, One Goal. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. I put a link to Dan's channel below. I'd highly recommend you subscribe to that and also subscribe to ours if you aren't ready to make sure you catch these every time they come out and also our Two Minute Tuesday videos which come out every single week. If you have any ideas or suggestions of people you'd like us to interview or topics you'd like us to cover, just drop me a message directly and if your selection wins, then I'll send you a drink of your choice, within reason of course. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one guys, thank you so much for tuning in today.